A converted Methodist preacher, Grandpa had the unique perspective of a pastor familiar with the beliefs and problems faced by ministers in mainstream Christianity as they compared with the believers of the message. Many of the pastors in the message either came from non-denominational or Pentecostal backgrounds, while the younger ones were born and raised in the message. Grandpa's sermons weren't like anything that you would hear in other churches. They were what mainstream Christianity would call testimonies, as they often included stories about the life and times of the prophet and Grandpa's memories of those experiences. The congregation would listen as he described the things that he witnessed in the prophet's ministry and explained why they were special to us, as though the prophet were writing extra pages in the book of Acts in the Bible. They also included humorous stories or sayings that the prophet had relayed to him, either in public or in private, which had significant appeal to the younger crowd who were born after the prophet's lifespan. Each and every person in the audience wanted to know everything that we could about these times, and Grandpa's insights were not common knowledge among other churches in the message. He was one of the few remaining people who knew the prophet personally. One of the prophet's sayings that my grandfather often repeated was, you can tell the type of person you are by the company that you keep. Of all the sayings, this is the one that was most insightful as it related to other members of the message. The prophet preached many sermons on the subject of separating yourself from unbelievers and avoiding the appearance of evil. If a person was affiliated with people that were doing things that were dreadfully wrong and remained in association with them after discovering the wrongdoing, they were acting as part of the problem and not part of the solution. When the prophet made these statements, he was usually referring to message believers associating with other Christians who did not believe the prophet. It was difficult, though, not to think about this saying as it related to the prophet remaining with Roy E. Davis after his criminal, unethical, and immoral background was made public. Did these sayings apply to the prophet? When I thought about the prophet's early days as a minister, I pictured a young man who was active in the local religious community, warning them about the soon coming judgment that would happen just before the end of days. I thought of him as a separatist, as he was later, even during what I thought were his early days as a minister. According to the prophet, he had been hearing a voice keeping him on the straight and narrow pathway to heaven all his life and during the times that he didn't listen to that voice, he was met with tragedy. He claimed to have heard that voice since he was a toddler. Jeffersonville, Indiana sits right on the outskirts of the Bible Belt, which is evident by the large number of churches in the city. There is a church on almost every street corner, some of which are new, but many that already existed at the time the prophet started his own ministry. Downtown Jeffersonville has beautiful church buildings with wonderfully architected designs that were popular in the 1800s and early 1900s. I pictured a young prophet visiting each of them. I pictured him using one of his other sayings, come follow me as I follow Christ. When I learned about the dreadful activities of his pastor during those years, I really started to question my mental images of what the prophet's early ministry would have looked like. Roy Davis was running from a criminal past, and he fled Louisville, Kentucky to Jeffersonville, Indiana to evade conviction, not because of any spiritual or religious intent. I became even more curious as to why the prophet stayed with him, not just during that time, but also for decades to come. As I collected articles about Roy Davis, I started putting them in chronological order to form a timeline. By linking the events by time, it became much easier to watch the story unfold. I knew from a few articles that I'd collected so far that Davis was not a reputable person by any standards. Reading them in order chronologically, however, it made me realize that the evil I had sensed was far bigger than one person.
This was an organized strategy. Multiple men had to be involved. No single person could have pulled it off. It was a coordinated effort and the profit was simply a cog in a much bigger wheel. When Roy Davis lost his foothold in Louisville, Kentucky, after a criminal conviction, he did not abandon his objectives in the Louisville and southern Indiana area. It was evident that Davis was a man on a mission, and though I did not have enough pieces of the puzzle to know what that mission was, it was very clear that he had gone too far to abandon it. It was also clear that other people were involved. If it were a one-man operation, he would have simply fled the area after his criminal conviction. Religious types do not generally categorize pastors with criminal records as reputable. Yet as the story began to unfold in Jeffersonville, his reputation was apparently unaffected by his negative publicity. I found this fact to be very strange. In 1931, Roy's brothers Dan S. Davis and Wilbur L. Davis migrated north from Texas to help Davis rebuild his operation. Like Roy, both brothers were ministers of the gospel, and they came to hold an old-fashioned revival in Jeffersonville. These were the same brothers who assisted Roy Davis in bank fraud, landing Roy Davis his first criminal conviction in the state of Texas and multi-state manhunt by the Texas Rangers. Like Roy, it was clear that his brothers were not reputable. Unlike Roy, however, neither appears to have been convicted in the bank fraud and they could still identify themselves as reputable preachers in the unsuspecting town of Jeffersonville, Indiana. Like Roy, the Davis brothers were more than likely involved with the Ku Klux Klan. As I would later find out, his brothers were assisting Roy in his effort to raise large sums of money by defrauding unsuspecting Christians, and that money was used for a cause that would later become even more evident later in my research. Regardless of their intent, his brothers' participation in the revival, combined with Roy Davis's secret meetings to recruit, was a successful combination. They were successful in helping their brother Roy back on track, even if their methods were less than honorable. Roy and his brothers held the revival and used the publicity of the revival to build reputation. He and his brothers convinced the news media that Roy was successful in organizing congregations in the South, failing to mention that his doing so was through the use of an alias or that some of those congregations ran him out of town. His brother, Dan Davis, relocated his family from El Paso, Texas to assist in Roy's mission. Oddly, Dan did not join Roy's church. Both Davis brothers had competing Pentecostal churches in Jeffersonville. At first, I found this to be very strange. When one thinks of a church as having a spiritual purpose, one would assume that like-minded men of faith could have greater impact as one church body. Their mission, however, had very little to do with the church. While operating each of their independent churches in Jeffersonville, the two men started an official mission in Louisville, Kentucky. By the early 1930s, Jeffersonville was growing by leaps and bounds. Over one million vehicles had crossed the new George Rogers Clark Memorial Bridge in 1930 bringing with them a new and quickly growing business of automobile sales to Jeffersonville. Even during the Great Depression, employment could easily be found across the river in Louisville, and those who had automobiles could easily find jobs. Just north of Jeffersonville was an amusement park, Rose Island. It was a favorite place for after-church gatherings on Sunday until the Episcopalians introduced dancing on their boat rides. This caused so much controversy that the sterner sects segregated themselves from the more liberal Christians of the 1930s who participated in the dancing. Rose Island had an amusement park, a hotel, a swimming pool, a wooden roller coaster named the Devil's Backbone, and a Ferris wheel. It also had wolves in a pen, monkeys in a cage, and a black bear named Teddy Roosevelt. Though it would have been appealing to the youth in the Prophet's Church, I couldn't picture this amusement park being frequented by the Davis brothers or the members of their Pentecostal assemblies. 
They would have sided with the fundamentalists and boycotted Rose Island due to the dancing long before it became popular among fundamentalists to do so. Digging through the newspaper articles, I found an obituary for Roy's brother, Dan S. Davis, in the June 15, 1949 issue of Courier Journal. All of Dan's five brothers were listed, including Roy, which was the first full list of Roy's brothers that I'd identified. The obituary stated that Dan was the head of the East Market Street Mission in Louisville. At first, I had assumed that Dan had eventually left Jeffersonville to start a new church in Louisville, but the word mission in the name caught my eye. If he was still a Pentecostal minister in 1949, what was the mission? By the 1940s, Pentecostalism was decreasing in popularity, and their mission was to survive. Why not East Market Street Pentecostal Church, or similar to Roy had deceitfully used, East Market Pentecostal Baptist? Was the prophet involved with this mission? Is this why he called Roy Davis's Pentecostal Church the Missionary Baptist? I found the initial charter granted for the mission. It was originally named the Bethel Rescue Mission. Using that name, I found several advertisements in the Louisville newspaper. Having only recently learned about the Ku Klux Klan's propaganda and negative views of the Jews, one advertisement in particular caught my eye. Reverend Dan Davis preached a sermon entitled, The Jew's Covenant with the Antichrist. This title sounded so familiar to what I could imagine the prophet preaching, which he more than likely had learned from Roy Davis. The prophet taught that the gospel of Jesus Christ was not for the Jews, a doctrine that most Christians, including the biblical apostle Paul, would have strongly disagreed with. The Bethel Rescue Mission keyword search unlocked a door that was hiding several pieces that were missing from the puzzle. In 1939, Reverend Dan Davis was arrested on charges of criminal conspiracy. Dan was on a mission, like his brother Roy, a mission to quickly accumulate a large sum of money. And I wanted to know what that money was being used for. I found another letter to the editor of the Courier Journal newspaper. Dan had opened the church with the name Bethel Rescue Mission, and it was the same name that many people had been using for Hope Rescue Mission of the Bethel Baptist Church. He and Roy could ask unsuspecting donors to contribute to the Bethel Rescue Mission and they would mistakenly assume that their money would be managed by trustees of the Bethel Baptist Church. Knowing that both Dan and Roy Davis had Pentecostal churches that deceitfully misled people into thinking Baptist, and that the prophet had used the same strategy in claiming to have been ordained in a Baptist church, the pieces of the puzzle were suddenly starting to fit together. What I didn't understand is why they did not simply join the Baptist Convention. Their motives and intent were clearly non-religious. One might even consider to be anti-religious. Studying the Baptist Convention, however, it became evident that the systems of checks and balances used in the mainstream churches would have hindered Roy, Dan, and the Prophet on their mission. Mainstream churches require accountability, and if one elder noticed another elder hoarding large sums of money, defrauding members, and violating both the law and the Christian codes of conduct, the offending party would be forced to step down. In many Pentecostal assemblies, however, pastors are accountable only to themselves. There is no official system of accountability established in these types of independent churches. This raised many questions about the prophet that I hadn't yet considered. Is this why he denied starting his ministry as a Pentecostal? Did the false impression of accountability increase his credibility? In his life stories, the prophet always presented himself as a Baptist minister whose traumatic life experience in 1937 led him to Pentecostalism. I found other articles in other states with similar arrests for Dan Davis and it was apparent that the Bethel Rescue Mission was the base for operations. Reverend Dan Davis and women assisting him were soliciting funds throughout the state of Kentucky. 
In one instance, Dan used the name Bethel Rescue Mission Milk Fund, which I found to be comical. Other articles about Dan were very interesting. I found Dan Davis was also arrested in Newcastle, Kentucky, after which he sued Major W.O. Olray. Somehow, Dan managed to convince Magistrate Tom Young to obtain two warrants for arrest. According to Dan Davis, Olray was interfering in the operation of the mission. Dan even had attorney C.R. Turner arrested, claiming intimidation. The circuit judge Thomas Ballantine called the evidence against Olray revolting. Charges against the Major Olray were immediately dropped. The judge said that he believed Dan Davis did not have clean hands. Shockingly, solicitors were paid 50% to collect money for the mission. There was one aspect missing from all the articles that I had found. Roy Davis. It was evident that Dan had moved from Texas to assist Roy in his mission, and I'd assumed that the mission started in Louisville would have been exploited to fund Roy's unknown purpose. Suddenly, I stumbled onto an article describing an accusation of Roy Davis for similar charges in his connection to the mission in 1930. Roy was, in fact, part of Dan Davis's mission. Dan was raising money, and Roy was using it. It read, Roy E. Davis, 40 years old, a preacher at the Holy Bible Mission, 711 East Jefferson Street, was held in $300 bond on a charge of obtaining money under false pretenses when he was arraigned Wednesday at the police court. His case was continued until Friday in order to allow the police time for further investigation. Miss Minnie Burgeon, 616 East Market Street, swore to the warrant. Davis denied the charges. This suddenly reminded me of a strange description of Roy Davis's Pentecostal church that the prophet frequently used. In one particular instance, the prophet used the word mission and then corrected himself to the word missionary. The prophet said that he was ordained by Davis in the mission, missionary Baptist church. When the prophet started preaching with Roy Davis, the mission was to accumulate large sums of money. This was the Missionary Baptist Church. When I thought about the men with whom the prophet was associating and discovered their illegal and unethical means to finance their operations, I began to wonder how long the prophet had worked with them. It was time to dig deeper into the early ministry of the prophet. How long was he active with Davis and the Davis brothers? How much did they influence his doctrine? Was his evangelistic career another means to provide funding for Davis? Was the Branham Tabernacle just another one of many churches that Roy Davis planted?